1970s were a dynamic era in Hollywood. It was a wonderful time for American film directors. And I thought Universal had a particularly strong group of iconic filmmakers. And they were passionate about movies. Jaws, American Graffiti, Smokey and the Bandit, so many risky movies. There was a belief system at Universal where people just trusted and believed in each other. And good work got done because of that. It was extraordinary. If you look back at the 70s, you know where the action was, and you look at these gritty character films, and it was such a, a clear time for great, epic character storytelling. High Plains Drifter, it's fantastic. There's things like The Sting, it's a great story, it's a wonderful movie, it has that cinematic uh, rug pulling that, that happens. The Sting was Paul Newman and Robert Redford at their best. The great Henry Gondor. They have very different acting styles. You know, Newman, it was very improvisational. Every take would be different. And so sometimes you could see Redford going like Paul. Just say the lines. Those two guys together, that chemistry is unbelievable. And it's a kind of chemistry that everybody is still trying to get. It seems worthwhile, doesn't it? And we talk about great screenplays. They don't get any better than The Sting in terms of little things that are set up and places where they reverse things on you. And that's just wonderful. It took me about six months to write the first draft. But when I got the idea about the fake FBI, that's when it all sort of came together. And I knew, ah, I can sting the audience as well. So that was part of the fun of it. <laughs> When American Graffiti came out, it was a movie unlike movies that had been made up until then. It had no movie stars, it wasn't a musical, but it almost moved like a musical. One thing you notice is the amazing pace of it. Like you feel like you want to go out cruising with these people all night. You want to bomb around? I want to trap my new wheel. But when you look at it carefully, you realize that you're following a bunch of plots, and like any great ensemble movie, it's all woven together, and everybody has an arc. They have heart. I just saw a vision. I saw a goddess. Come on, you gotta catch up to her. I think what was really special about American Graffiti was 1973 was a really tough time in America. We'd survived two Kennedy assassinations, the Martin Luther King assassination, the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement. And American Graffiti transported us back to a time of innocence and when things were good in America. And it gave us a romantic moment to feel good about the country. I'm always impressed by the, the big mega hits Universal's been a part of. But also some great comedy has come out of, out of that company. The new phone book's here! The new phone book's here! Well, I wish I could get that excited about book. Things are going to start happening to me now. The Jerk was one of the most important movies of my entire childhood. I was a gigantic Steve Martin fan. And then The Jerk comes out. Murray! Murray! And he made the perfect movie that captured his sense of humor. Would it be too much if I asked for a kiss? No. There are so many great lines in The Jerk. The new phone books are here. Die, gas pumper. Die, gas pumper! You try and say that without laughing. I don't need anything except this. And I need this. And then I'm, I'm and I need this. And this. And then and I'll and I'll just take that. The jerk is just the epitome of a movie that's got very smart jokes that is just ridiculous. Yahoo! 
Sorry, I don't want to get married. That makes two of us. One of the reasons that Smokey worked so well was Jackie Gleason. Oh, I'm wouldn't blind. And 80% of what he said in Smokey and the Bandit, he wrote. I mean, he came up with some of the damnedest ideas that were great. Do you know who you're talking to? I happen to be Buford T. Justice. He kind of captures the American sensibility of what Southern justice really was like. And you could tell he's having fun. <laughs> You have to make a list of five favorite comedies. I'd say the majority of those lists would, would include Animal House. Well, first of all, the script was very funny. I mean, it was truly funny. Your Delta Tau guy name is Pinto. Why Pinto? Why not? John was so powerful. Just the first day working with him, I took away, I'd say 30 or 40% of his dialogue. Because he had that wonderful face. He could just convey thoughts and ideas just with a look. That eyebrow. Animal House, it goes for it comedically. It went for it in terms of, you know, sex and language and just anarchy. Food fight! But it had a different way of looking at what is the leading man and hero in a movie. And in Animal House, they said, what about the slobs? And, you know, the average person looking at that will say, yeah, that's me and my friends. Wait a minute, we're OK to be the good guys? So it was subversive and fun. It was really the beginning of a kind of new comedic language. Even though it was technically set in 1962, it really represented the attitude of the late 70s and just the way the characters behaved and spoke. You just never saw that before in an American or any kind of movie. And really represented the kind of energy and rambunctiousness of the baby boom generation at that moment. Sorry. When I was growing up, we spent part of our time in New York City and part of our time in Sag Harbor, which is a small seaside town. We lived on a boat. And one of my first experiences watching a film was Jaws. Jaws is just very much about this primal fear. But obviously, the making of that movie is kind of legendary as to how problematic it was. The idea of shooting on real water it just is, is nuts. The front's moving. By the time we're ready to shoot that way, it's going to be all the way down there. The second we committed to the ocean with a mechanical shark, which only worked periodically, that's when I saw we were going to be there for a long, long time. We would be at sea and not get a single shot. And, and other days, where we'd be out at sea and only get a shot before lunch and a shot just before the sun was too low to film. And so I had to keep finding and keep discovering what Jaws was all about and how to make it scary. And not having a shark actually helped me make the movie scarier than if I had a working shark. I think the most amazing thing about Jaws to me is the shark is just kind of this thing. It's almost like a, uh, a MacGuffin in a way, because I watch those performances. And then you realize that it's not at all this sort of thriller about a shark in the water. It's about how these people bond together over a terrifying incident. And then, you know, it transitions into a movie about bonding and brotherhood. It's very rare. Whoever have one do this before? I don't know. It was the first movie that was the great worldwide event. This thing was just showing and showing and showing. It changed cinema. Jaws reconfigured what happens in the summer, you know, the sort of invention of the summer blockbuster. It really lands right at his feet. I had never experienced anything like that before. I didn't intend to make it a cultural phenomenon. I just intended to finish the movie and get home. I mean, that was, that was my goal. My goal was to come home safely. In hindsight, 
I can see that I was making pictures in Hollywood system at an amazingly fertile time. We knew we had something special, and it was wonderful to be on that campus, to know that I'm in the same place as these spectacular artists. It just must be in the Universal Book of Rules or something, page one. Is it a good story? Make that movie. It's fantastic.